All right, good afternoon, everybody. It's that time of the weekend, time for your GIS practicum. So what we have on tap for today is terrain analysis. And again, we have started to work in grass. We're gonna to continue to work in grass. And if you wanna work from QGIS, if you like that interface, you can probably do everything we're gonna do using that interface I showed you last time. But I'm gonna show you how to do it natively within grass. Uh, because that's the way I do it and I, uh, I think there are some benefits from simply using some of the grass tools. And in fact, one of the very first things we're going to do is to look at it in true 3D, look at our terrain, and you can do that in QGIS, but it's a lot easier to do it in grass. So uh, I mentioned before um, what we're going to do is to continue through these practicums and I'm going to teach you the skills that you need uh, to have in order to complete the projects and I'm basically going to show you each step of the projects as we continue and we're going to do that today and I'm going to give you a few tips here and there additional tips for some productivity within uh, grass and or QGIS or the other pieces of software that we will eventually start to use as well so just a, a quick little hint on that note um, here I have grass I started it up as I normally do and I have it aimed at a different grass um, data folder. And I just want to show you the power of the organization of the way grass needs you to have locations, map sets, and then your data imported within those. So this is actually my, my normal research grass location. You can see I have a whole bunch of different um, grass locations and I've got them la labeled some of them have geographic labels, the, the sort of datum and CRS. Some of them are labeled, you know, the place in the world or the time period, etc. And you can see within them over here, I often have multiple map sets that I use to simply organize what it is that I'm doing. Uh, and you can keep grass data directories sort of parallel to each other, totally separated. So this is my main research grass data location, but I have kept the project location for this class uh, separated in this grass data location which I open up and you see basically all I have here is the Wadi Hassa uh, WS84 UTM zone 36 north uh, map set uh, location and permanent map set and I'm going to create a map set for project 2 and you saw here just a little uh, uh, additional hint, which is you can't use spaces in any name in grass, and you shouldn't use dashes either. Uh, spaces will give you an error just because uh, that's the way it is, and dashes may be misinterpreted as a minus sign when we get to doing map algebra. So I recommend using the underscore character to sort of take the place of a space or a dash. And so here I have project underscore two and there we go uh, and we're going to just going to start up in grass like so and it's doing its thing I put it on my I have two screens over here so let me drag them back over to the screen that's currently being recorded there we go okay so we looked at some of this stuff last time we can display uh, the SRTM map like so Oh, by the way, I am on my office computer today, not in the lab. You might tell from the background. And I have a, a uh, dark theme set up. So all the windows in grass uh, have like a dark background. So it'll look different from when you do it unless you set up a dark theme. I'm just cool that way where I like everything black and white like that on my own personal computer stuff. Okay, that aside, this is where we're at right now. We've got, remember, our layer manager, and we got our display manager. And we looked at some of these uh, display tools for panning and zooming and adding legends and that kind of stuff. Let's look very first, because we're talking about terrain, we're talking about 3D data in, in the GIS. Let's actually use the 3D view of grass, which is pretty neat, because what it does is it takes that cell value, the Z value, in every single raster cell in that gridded matrix of raster values that you're looking at here and uses that to display it in a perspective 3D view. And it's simply assessed up here where you see 2D view, you click it, and you go 
3D view, and then it chugs along and it shows you this. And you'll notice that over here in the layer manager, you've got a whole new suite of tools for panning and zooming and moving around, and then your map display has turned into a perspective view. Now a lot of these tools will still work. You can pan with the pan tool and you can zoom in and out with uh, these tools uh, pretty much the same way you used to be able to, uh, you're used to doing in the uh, plan view, the 2D view, but now you gotta remember that you're looking at it from an angle as if you're like sitting in a helicopter looking down at, uh, at the earth. Uh, and it gives you a few more additional tools like rotating around the, an axis like so and you can even create fly-throughs like or move as if your 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 helicopter is moving right uh, and so you can play around with these tools you can do much of the same thing from over here by basically dragging it. and essentially this little dot is your helicopter and you're either getting closer or further away and this is uh, essentially like your telescope that you're looking at of so you can zoom in or out and then you can tilt the scene this way uh, and uh, you can also set your sort of the elevation of your helicopter you know going straight up and down uh, this way so uh, you can play around with that and if you want to reset it there's a button that says reset and you'll go back like, if you zoomed way in or you're looking at it because literally you can flip this so that you're looking like from the bottom of the earth and everything looks weird just know that you can go down here and hit reset and you can get back to the view uh, that, you, that you're looking for. Um, so what I would recommend is uh, playing around with these settings over here um, and these uh, tools for, for navigating and seeing which one of those seems to be the most intuitive to you. Um, I like, you know, this is the old school way of doing it so I kind of like this way. And what I'm doing right now is setting my view so that I'm looking from the west towards the east pretty much and I'm looking basically right up the Wadi Hassa now I can start to see some of the elevation down here is actually the Dead Sea the Dead Sea Plain and the Dead Sea itself this is the main canyon area and this is the eastern area which opens up into the desert so we get a good sense of the topography one additional tool that you can play around with is this Z exaggeration and what this does is it makes the terrain more pronounced or less pronounced so if you set it down to zero, everything goes flat. So by default, one means each meter is displayed at a factor of one. So if you take it and you go up to two, each meter is now represented as if it was two meters. And you can keep going with that, three, four, five, in, until you get really kind of uh, crazy exaggeration. You may have noticed that your actual point of view has changed because it's literally changing the scale of everything, including the distance of your floating helicopter looking down. So you're going to have to go in and change the height to look back down at the same pers perspective. And now you can see, oh my goodness, you can really see that 5 is perhaps a little too much. So let's drag it down to around 3 or maybe just 2 is enough. And again, adjust our perspective. Now let's zoom in uh, using either the zoom tool and just clicking in the area you want to zoom. Or you can use the actual mouse scroll wheel like that. Or you could even change your perspective by bringing your helicopter closer in. And when we get to a certain zoom level, we'll start to see that the terrain doesn't look as smooth as it did. And that's because by default, grass sort of coarsens up the resolution of the raster to make it easier or faster to display on your screen. So if you want to look at it in the native resolution of the raster file, you got to go over here into the layer manager and see these tabs at the top. Go to the data tab you'll notice that right now we only have one raster map displayed. That's good, because uh, we only have one. And we see the draw mode, and it says fine. And it says fine mode resolution six. That means it's coarsening each pixel by a factor of six. So it's combining six pixels to display them at a coarser resolution. So we just change that to one, and we get to the native resolution of uh, the actual landscape, which in this case the SRTM is at 30 meter resolution. And now everything looks smoother and more realistic, which is good. And if we wanted to, we can show the course mode, which is this thing, course mode. So every time 
we uh, pan or zoom around in here, it'll flash, you see, to the course mode, which makes it easier on the computer to render. And then once you let go or you stop moving, it'll go back to the fine mode. And the course mode can be represented as a coarse surface or uh, as a wire grid, which is sometimes kind of cool and useful. And maybe you want to look at the course mode and you can change the wire grid like, you know, like so. And now you're looking at the landscape as if it was a wire mesh. Uh, so that's a couple of tips right over there. Uh, you can do a couple other explorations here, looking at transparencies and other things like that. Uh, and eventually I'll show you how to, how to deal with this color uh, to overlay another piece of information. But at this moment we don't have any other information to overlay, so we're going to leave that alone. The only other little thing I'm going to show you right now is the Appearance tab. And here, this is no longer the helicopter, this is actually the angle of the sun. So we want to change the shadows, like instead of morning shadows, we can do late afternoon shadows, or we can even do like a noontime sun like so. And we can make the sun sort of closer to the horizon or further away from the horizon. So typically, you know, we wouldn't have the sun coming out of the north. That would be a really weird thing to look at. So we like to keep it, you know, in a realistic zone from east across the sky to setting in the west. But you can use this to highlight different features. So if you're really trying to look at how uh, certain landscape features that are facing, I don't know, east show up, you might want to put the sun over in the west to get the shadow or the, or, or the illumination on them as well. And then you can change the sort of overall brightness of the scene and the ambient is like the uh, essentially like the evenness of the lighting. Uh, you can change that over here until you get a scene that is pretty good. And at this point you can do the same thing you did with the 2D scene which is to save out uh, an image size like so. Uh, you can also put um, map decoration so you see lighting and you can make the lighting go away then you've got decorations including things like a north arrow uh, in this case you can set the scale and map units so let's say I want to be one kilometer I put a thousand I click place arrow and then you see over here I got crosshairs and I can stick it now because we're in a perspective view I want to notice that if I put it further away the arrow is actually going to become smaller than if I put it closer that's because things in the distance actually look smaller. Uh, and you can do the same thing here with a scale bar. So let's put 10 kilometers and we'll place the scale bar here and it looks like that size. And uh, we can place the scale bar further in and you can see it looks a little smaller. So uh, you can play around with all of those tools to see how you would, can uh, sort of make a somewhat interesting uh, this, this sort of 3D display view. Okay, at this point we're going to pop on back to the 2D view and we'll get right back to what we're looking at, the map display showing the bird's eye view of the entire Wadi Hasa. We have no 3D sense of it though, so we're just looking at the color. We can do something that's similar to looking at it in 3D, uh, or at least it gives us a little bit of shadow or shading, and that is to create a hill shade map of this. And I showed you um, where we access all of our tools in Grass last time, which is up here in the Layer Manager. And since we're dealing with rasters, we're going to go to the Raster menu, and we're going to look for, uh, you know, these tools you know are sort of organized according to what it is you're trying to do so we're going to go down to the terrain analysis uh, menu item and we'll see a whole bunch of modules over here and the one that we want to do is to pick the one that says compute shaded relief r dot relief and again it brings up a module as all the ra uh, grass tools do and by default since we had our hasa 30 srtm already selected over here it's put it into this uh, field which is the name of the input map and then we have this other field name of the output map so what I like to do is to simply highlight this name right click copy right click paste 
underscore hill shade, right? Like so. And then we could hit run right now, but we can go down here and we could potentially change the angle of the sun, putting it more in the east or the west. We could also make it higher or lower off the horizon, much in the same way, simply by adding or subtracting from these numbers. Uh, so we could, this could be 15 degrees up or 45 degrees up, and this can be 270 all the way to 180 degrees east or west. And then the optional, we can actually add some uh, relief like we did in the 3D view. So I'll go ahead and put um, a factor of 2, let's say, for that. And now I'm just going to hit run and it'll chug along. And you see, I can close that. I now have a shade of relief and it actually looks a little 3D. Now this is still a flat map. The shading that is no longer the actual elevation values, it's literally the amount of shadow that would be cast by the sun in that direction. And we can now use this to uh, sort of data fuse, if, uh, fuse two different uh, kinds of data. So if I bring this down and I put it underneath the SRTM, obviously the SRTM is opaque at this moment, so you can't see the hill shade. I can right click on this and change the opacity level to like 50%. And now all of a sudden, you can see through it, it's like, you know, not 100% clear, it's 50% opaque still, but you can start to see some of that hill shade shining through from the bottom. So maybe 50% is a little too much, so we'll bring it up to 60%, and it still is looking kind of washed out, right? We can bring it up to 75%, and now it's starting to look, the colors are popping, but the hill shade is sort of not really shining through enough, and even if we go up like that, we're, we're losing some of that 3D and it's looking a little washed out. So you can totally do this with the opacity value, but because of this uh, washed outedness, there exists actually a special display technique. So I'm going to reset the opacity to 100%. There exists actually a special display technique to fuse the colors from one map onto the hill shade. And so up here in the layer manager, this is how we normally add a raster map. Right next to it, it says add various raster map layers, including you see that uh, shaded relief. So we click on that, and we go down to where it says add shaded relief map layer. And now we have actually two fields where we can put in A, our hill shade, and B, the map whose colors we want to borrow. Uh, and it will drape the colors over that like so. And you can see all of a sudden the colors are a lot more saturated and we still get that uh, really nice shadow shading from our hill shade. Now one last little tip over here under the optional tab we have percent to brighten and you can increment this up like this or you can literally just put your cursor in there and type in like 30 percent and that will just brighten everything up a little bit. Usually 30 percent is about right. So now we have a hill shade map with the colors from the elevation map fused onto it just in the display menu. And you see this is actually its own display menu item. Below it we still have our SRTM and below that we still have our uncolored hill shade map. Like so. So this is a really cool way to very quickly make a nice perfectly bird's eye view looking down at your flat map, but give it a little 3D pop when you're going to make your final map products. So we're getting a good sense of the terrain here. Let's delve into a couple of special tools to actually derive some of those um, second and third order properties of the terrain. And again, remember, we just had one elevation DEM file, raster file to start with, and you're going to see how many second order, secondary products we can derive from just that data. There's a lot of really cool things that we can do. The first thing we probably want to do is to calculate the slope and the aspect. And if you remember, the slope is essentially the rise over the run, and the aspect is the direction that the slope is diving into. So we'll go back to our raster tools, and we will go down to our terrain analysis again, and we will find the module called slope and aspect r.slope.aspect. And again, our module pops out. You'll notice that uh, at this moment, we don't have our SRTM automatically loaded in there. So let's go in there, 
find it under our permanent map set and under the outputs we have a slope map so what we want to do is again I like to copy the first part here copy paste underscore slope I guess I don't need to do it in all caps I'm not yelling at you through my keyboard and we have aspect over here so paste uh, aspect and while we're at it let's get those two kinds of curvatures the rate of slope change in that direction and the rate of slope change in this direction so profile curvature which I often just do PC as the uh, uh, abbreviation and tangential curvature which I do TC so we have uh, essentially four things slope aspect PC and TC and I'm putting that prefix on there so I know that it's this particular map that I have uh, derived those things from at the 30 meter resolution and I hit run and you'll notice in the background it's added three maps so if I close off my hill shade which is on top we will see the tangential curvature the profile curvature, the aspect, which looks a lot like hill shade, and the slope. All right. So at this particular moment, what we might want to do is to fuse slope onto our hill shade. And so here's what our hill shade looks like with the colors from elevation. But you can just double click on it again, or right click properties, and you're back into your D dot shade module and you'll see that we have our colors coming from the SRTM. Now we can just go in and select the colors coming from the slope and there we have our data fusion and it might be too bright these colors are a little brighter so we might want to take this down to like 10 and click OK. Right? Now here's a crazy thing if we have this well, all these two things selected and viewed and we want to go into our 3D view it's going to look crazy. Nothing's going to pop. Nothing's going to look proper. And that is because the 3D view really needs the actual elevation values in it in order for it to um, be able to display correctly. So if all we have is our slope values, like so, we go into our 3D view, it's not going to look like anything because the slope values are just between 0 and 90. So it's not going to have a lot of relief and it's not going to look like a 3D map. Instead, what you need to do is to go back and have just your base elevation map, your DEM selected, and nothing else needs to be selected at this particular moment. Uh, you turn your 3D view on, and now it looks like 3D again, right? In order to bring in those colors, if you wanted to have a perspective view like this with the colors fused onto this, you need to go into the Data tab again, and then go down here where it says Service Attributes, Color, Map, and here by default it's picking the same map it's deriving the 3D information from which was our SRTM DEM instead you can click down here and pick any of your other maps slope PCTC or whatever and all of a sudden you see the color is now coming from that map but the 3D information is still coming from our 30 meter SRTM elevation file and now you can uh, you know, navigate around in this in exactly the same way you were doing before, but the color is coming from that second map. And again, this is a kind of data fusion. The same way we did it with the Hillshade, we're now doing it with the true 3D view in our perspective 3D viewer window as well. Okay, so back to our 2D view. We have slope and we have aspect. And the r.slope.aspect module calculates this at the lowest or the smallest resolution it possibly can, which is a three pixel window. So if we bring up our r slope aspect again, and I'm going to make it real big so that I can go to the manual page, you can scroll down in here and you can see exactly how it calculates slope across that window. Remember in class I said maybe you want to do it over a coarser scale because it's more meaningful to the human decision making factors that are going in. So in that case we have another tool that we can use also under terrain analysis and it's called uh, terrain parameters or r.param scale. 
And in this case, we can uh, decide which one we want to do by going to the optional tab and selecting slope. And now we have a size of processing window. Instead of a 3 by 3, we can increase that to like a 9 by 9 window. And remember, uh, we're working at a 30 meter cell resolution, so it's 9 times 3, 9 times 30, uh, becomes the new resolution at which slope is going to be calculated at. So in that particular case, what's that? Let me do the math in my head <laughs> real quick. Tw 200 and uh, uh, 2,700 meters, right? Okay, so that's going to be the new resolution. So back to the required tab, I'll put uh, HASA SRTM underscore slope, whoops, I need the actual, underscore slope, underscore 9x9. That will just tell me the scale that I'm doing this, and I can hit run. Now I have slope at a very different scale, and you'll see by default it's doing the Veritas color scheme, which is not particularly useful for slope, so I'm going to right click on it, and then I'm going to go to set color table, and I'm going to go to the Define tab, Name of Color Table. I'm going to find the one that's labeled Slope in here, which is down here. Then I'm going to hit Run. And now I get my colors back to Slope over here. And so that I can interpret them, I'm going to add a raster legend for Slope 9 by 9. And where did it go? There it is. I don't know why I put it way off to the side like so, but it did. So now I can see uh, what it means. Zero slope, zero degree slope to 53 in this particular case. Okay, so we can fool around with that. We can change the scale, uh, but you'll notice under the optional tab, slope is just one of a lot of different things that you can calculate. Aspect, profile curvatures, etc. One really neat thing that you can calculate is this thing called feature. And again, it's sensitive to the scale that you're going to choose and a couple of these other things. Well, let's just try that. And uh, we're going to call this uh, SRTM features, and again, 9x9 for the 9 by 9 window. And when we run that, we're going to get a cool looking map out of it that looks like this. And if I want to go in there, oops. Zoom previous. If I want to go in there and see what any of these things mean, what I can do is set my scale to match that uh, features map and drag it down like so. It's a little hard to see on these colors, so I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. There you go. Gray is something that's perfectly flat, planar, and in this case, the Dead Sea is the only perfectly flat thing. Uh, black is a pit, meaning a little really like a basin or a hole in the ground. Blue is an area that's filled with channels. Green is a pass, like a saddle that you would go up and over a mountain ridge. Uh, yellow are mountain ridges, and red are peaks, literally peaks. And so if I zoom in on my map, we can see at the 9 by 9 resolution that we told it to, how it's going to start to classify up the landscape. And we can now go back into our hillshade map and double click on it to get to our properties here and put this features map as the hillshade. And I think we need to brighten that guy up again to 30. And we can start to now see how the actual topography is uh, parsed by this module into different kinds or different uh, types of landscapes. Uh, plan planar areas, ridges, channeled areas, peaks, right? And it may be that uh, 9 by 9 was too coarse of a scale, so we may want to take it back down to 3 by 3, and we can do that again, 3x3. And we'll get something like that. And you can see it's a totally different pattern. Uh, and we can now fuse that one into our hillshade, like so. 
and we can see, oh, that's a much more interesting, you know, kind of pattern. We can actually see channels and stuff and the ridges between them. So that's all pretty cool. Uh, what else can we do? What else can we do that might be useful at this particular moment? Well, I think the last thing that we can do is to actually do a true hydrological model and derive uh, stream locations as a vector file of actual lines where streams would go. So we can see how grass is really easily able to parse up the landscape uh, using those derivatives of topography, including slope and curvature, um, it can do that and also route the flow of water along uh, the path of least resistance. And we have a really cool tool to do that uh, under this hydrological modeling menu item in the raster menu. Uh, and find the one over here that says, um, where is it? Ard watershed, watershed analysis. So, in this particular case, we need to, in the input tab, simply give it the SRTM that's in permanent down here. And uh, at this particular moment, we don't have to do anything else. Go to the output tab, and we put accumulation raster map. That's going to be the map of the accumulated flow of water across the landscape. So, again, what I like to do is just copy this as a... a sort of uh, prefix that we can paste in there and then flow ACC short for flow accumulation value and under the optional tab uh, one thing I like to do is to use this one that says use positive flow accumulation even for likely underestimates this just makes the map a little bit easier to um, manipulate with uh, with algebra afterwards everything else can be left alone hit run. This might take just a little bit of time depending on your computer, but there we go. And if I uh, change my raster uh, legend to now uh, be aligned to the flow accumulation map, we'll get this crazy looking legend like this where most of the values look black. And that's because almost all the values are super high in this region. There actually a lot of uh, water would concentrate and flow in those areas. So let's, uh, instead of looking at this legend right now, let's go back to our hillshade map and fuse in the flow ACC so that we can see how this uh, flow pattern relates to topography. And now it's starting to make sense. We can see the water concentrating into these gullies coming into these small feeder streams and then down into these main rivers which are then flowing through the big canyon up uh, towards the sort of west or northwest in eventually into the Dead Sea. And that's all real cool uh, but this is still a raster map and we wanted to extract a vector map of the streams. So let's go uh, back over here to our uh, raster menu, hydrologic modeling, and then down where it says extraction of stream networks r.stream.extract and what we can do is put in our SRTM again and now we need to choose a cutoff value for uh, where we want our streams to transition into uh, from nothing you know basically like you know overland flow into real streams and you can choose uh, a value just sort of off the top of your head or since we already have our flow accumulation map over here what we can do is uh, zoom in on one of these areas and figure out where we feel kind of comfortable you know what color blue we feel kind of comfortable with we're going to use our query tool to click on it and it'll tell you a value in this case it's uh, 1216.12 so we can say somewhere around uh, 1200 maybe we can even round it up to a thousand if we click somewhere up here yeah somewhere in here we're getting around a thousand and that feels okay for me on this landscape so back over here in our stream extract we can put 1000 in here now if we wanted to uh, we could speed the process up a little bit by inputting our flow accumulation map but we don't have to 
In our output map, what we should do is to create a, uh, you know, you can create a raster map of green extremes. You can have a raster map of flow directions. In this case, all we really need is a vector map of unique stream IDs. So what I'm going to do is paste in my <laughs> hasa 30 srtm and put streams and vector, just so I know that that's what I'm doing. And really, at this particular point, we can just hit run. And it's going to run through the same flow accumulation routine, which it would, wouldn't have to do if we fed it that map. Then it's going to write out the uh, vector map of streams. And you can kind of see them in there, uh, but they're by default thin black lines. So we're just going to style them by either right clicking on our new vector streams map or double clicking it. And we're going to go to lines, and we're going to increase the width. Uh, and we are going to change the color from black to a nice stream colored blue. And then we're going to click OK. And now, if we hide our flow accumulation, uh, we can actually see our streams uh, there in the background popping out. And we zoom back out, and you can see we have all these streams. Now, you may be wondering why there are X's at the front of them. That's because, by default, this uh, routine uh, essentially creates points where all the streams start and where they intersect, in addition to just the lines. And if you don't want to see those points, go back into the D.Vex, so right-click on it, Properties, or double-click on it. And on the tab that says Selection, uncheck Point and you'll see it'll only show the lines and those X's will go away for now. And now we have a really cool map of uh, vector streams and we have the, the value for the elevation behind there. And if we wanted to, with just these two maps displayed, we can pop back on over to the 3D view and you'll see that those things are now displayed in 3D as well. Back over here on the data tab, we have our service raster map, and uh, we have the slope displayed, and we have the lines, but we also still have the points, in this case displayed as little balls. And if we don't want that, we can click on the vector tab, and uh, over here on the vector tab, we see that we have our streams vector maps, we have show vector lines turned on with vector width 2, uh, but we also have show vector points selected, so we can turn that off. And we can choose our colors. Let's say we wanted our, our uh, darker blue. And we can increase the width of them, like so. And we can style them any way we want and display them as such. So that does it for this week's practicum. Um, again, we're going to keep building on our skills in grass. So we're going to use some of these outputs, including slope and the other things, as we continue on in Project 2 and eventually also into Project 3. See ya this afternoon.